I want to thank you, Ranking Member Carper, and, and please thank uh, Chairman Johnson for inviting me to testify. And I want to thank the rest of the committee members uh, also uh, for also serving as our board of directors. You're, as you know, you're about the only board we have now, so we appreciate that. Uh, you've asked me to focus today on the uh, impact of, of legislative and regulatory burdens that were placed on the Postal Service, including the mandate to uh, pre-fund retiree health benefits. But before I do so, I'd like to uh, comment on the broader theme of the hearing, the, uh, the reality facing the Postal Service. In recent years, that, uh, that reality has changed dramatically for the better. Uh, we're not in 2009 anymore when the Great Recession sent mail volume plummeting and along with the pre-funding mandate crushed the Postal Service's finances and raised doubts about the viability of the Postal Service. In fact, in more recent years, we've returned to operational profitability, earning $2.6 billion over the past two years. Our pension funds are healthy and better funded at 92 percent than most private sector pensions. And we have set aside some $50 billion, more than two decades of future retiree health care premiums, when most large private companies have not set aside a dime. Postal employees never doubted the viability of the Postal Service, despite seeing the loss of 200,000 postal jobs since 2006. Postal productivity has increased dramatically, and we have consistently advocated sensible reforms. Thanks to solid direct mail growth and booming e-commerce, total volume has stabilized in 2015, and total revenue has increased to $69 billion. As we continue to balance the challenges and the opportunities posed by technological change in the decades ahead, the Postal Service is going to remain a vital part of the nation's infrastructure. With an approval rating of 83 percent from the American people, we believe it can thrive in the 21st century with the right public policies. That said, there are three significant legislative regulatory burdens placed on the Postal Service under current law that should be addressed by this Congress. First, there's the legal requirement to massively fund future retiree health premiums decades in advance, regardless of the financial conditions facing the agency or facing the country. All told, 86 percent of the service's $57 billion in reported losses since 2007 stem from this inflexible mandate. Over the years, NELC has suggested a variety of legislative measures to address the pre-funding mandate. Fortunately, this committee has reached bipartisan consensus on an approach to address the burden during the last Congress. Reforms to the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program to maximize participation in Medicare among eligible postal retirees would all but eliminate the remaining $50 billion unfunded liability for future retiree health, while raising Medicare spending by less than two-tenths of 1 percent annually. Given that the Postal Service and its employees have contributed billions to Medicare, we urge you to adopt this approach again. Second, Congress should reconsider the policy that requires 100 percent of postal retirement funds be invested in low-yielding Treasury bonds. Together, the Civil Service Retirement System and the FERS system, those pension accounts, and the Postal Retiree Health Fund hold nearly $340 billion in Treasury securities. That makes the Postal Service and its employees the third largest creditor of the United States federal government, just behind China and Japan. No private company in America would invest its retirement assets in such an unsophisticated way, especially during a period when Treasuries are yielding 2 to 4 percent returns and, of course, health care costs are growing between 5 and 7 percent annually. At least with the Retiree Health Fund, Congress should adopt private sector best practice, which is to invest long-term retirement funds in well-diversified portfolios of private stocks, bonds, and real estate, as well as government bonds. The current policy forces the mailing industry to basically give Uncle Sam a low-cost loan instead of sensibly investing to 
cover future health care liabilities. My submitted testimony makes the case for prudent, prudent investment change and also addresses common objections to it and explains how several independent agencies invest successfully in private securities. By changing the retiree health fund's investment policy, Congress could raise the long-term rate of return on the fund's assets, achieve our pre-funding goals, offset the cost of postal Medicare integration, relieve upward pressure on postage rates, and reduce the misguided impulse to cut services. Third, in my full testimony, I address the postage rate making process, which the Postal Regulatory Commission will formally review in 2017. In the meantime, Congress should reverse the scheduled expiration of the 4.3 percent exigent rate enacted during the recession and suspend any CPI-based rate increases until the PRC review is complete. This will preserve the financial response, uh, I'm sorry, the financial stability of the Postal Service as the PRC does its work. Let me conclude by noting there's a remarkable degree of consensus among postal stakeholders about the principles of successful reform. All four unions, the Postal Service, and a wide range of companies providing financial services, prescription drugs, newspapers, direct mail products, and e-commerce sales have agreed on a set of principles for your consideration. I've attached a copy to my full testimony. In brief, our industry coalition urges you to first stabilize the postal finances by making the exigent increase permanent and freezing cap postage rates until the PRC review is complete. And second, resolve the pre-funding burden by maximizing Medicare integration among postal participants in FIBA and sensibly changing the way we invest the retiree health fund. Our coalition's recommendations are grounded in best, best private sector practice and are drawn from the consensus provisions of your bill, Senator Carper. They represent the measures on which the coalition could agree while remaining confident that they would stabilize the Postal Service for years to come, which will allow the service to adapt to meet the evolving needs of the nation. Senator Carper, you and former Senator Tom Coburn, along with Senator Johnson's support, deserve a lot of credit for your determined and patient work in helping to build this consensus during the last Congress. So now, let's finish the job, and in doing so, the NELC is ready and willing to engage committee members and all stakeholders on any other issues of interest, such as FECA changes, service standard issues, et cetera. Thank you, Senator Carper and members of the committee for inviting me to testify today. Mr. President, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us, and thanks for, for your testimony and for, for your kind words, and uh, we uh, very much look forward to, to working and getting this job done. I usually listen to NPR on my way to the train station in the morning from my house. It's not too far away. And uh, about a year or two ago, uh, they were reporting on an international study that had been, and uh, they'd ask uh, thousands of people all over the world, uh, what is it that makes you like your job? And what enhances your morale in, in the work that you do? Some people like getting paid. Some people said they liked the folks they work with, the environment in which they work. Some people said they liked um, uh, having a pension, they liked having health benefits, they liked having vacation time. But you know what most people said they liked? They said the thing that they liked most about their job was the, uh, they knew that the work that they were doing was important and they felt that they were making progress. They knew that the work they're doing is important and they felt they were making progress. Well, the work that the Postal Service does with all their partners and for all of us is, is important, real important. Some places incredibly important. And uh, what we have to do is to do the enabling work in this committee and this body in which we serve to enable the Postal Service, for your members, for your customers, to, uh, to do the important work of our country. The, uh, uh, the question I would, uh, would, uh, would have, if I can, a uh, question uh, for, for President Rolando, would, uh, let's go back to the Medicare integration my own view, I've, I've, I've always said, this is a liability. The question is, why do we have to address it in 10 years? And when most uh, businesses, a lot of businesses never address it, don't even think much about it. And I think it's a liability that needs to be addressed. But uh, what we have proposed in our legislation is to do, to do it over 40, to amortize it over 40 is up to 80% of the liability. Does that seem like a reasonable approach to you? 
Yes, I, I think we're, we're pretty close to the same page on the Medicare integration. The, the, the issue, just from listening to the, uh, uh, the first panel, was the, was the whole idea that um, we're shifting a liability uh, to Medicare uh, off of a balance sheet when, when in fact uh, all we're looking to do is reduce the liability by allowing postal employees to participate in, in, in a program and, and it seems the questioning is well, well how much have postal employees put in versus how much came out and I don't think postal employees should be treated differently that way this isn't an ERISA plan it's a, it's a social insurance program uh, if there's something wrong with the Medicare program, that's, that's for a different day and a different hearing. But we just want to participate uh, like everybody else does in, in Medicare because we pay in li like everybody else. So I don't see it as a, a shift in that liability in any way, shape, or form as was Thank characterized you. earlier today. Yeah, I, I, I fully concur. So Dr. Coburn and I, when we um, discussed this issue first time three years ago, uh, he and I both came to the conclusion there's an equity question, equity fairness. And how can you say that the... the uh, number two employer in the, in the country that pays more into Medicare maybe than almost anybody else, that their, uh, their retirees can't derive the full benefit of those payments. It's just not fair. It's not, it's not right. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson, if I could, a question. Uh, in October... Uh but I want to, again, emphasize that we can't ignore the fourth stakeholder, which is the American customer, and improving service must be part of any postal reform package. And um, I want Fred to ask you, um, can, can uh, the rural senators um, have your continued commitment to um, work to incorporate those customers that you see every day, that your, your, your people have the connection with, make sure that they're represented at the table? Absolutely, Senator. We're, we're, we're on the front lines uh, with the customers. We, we hear about it, uh, we hear about it uh, every day. We know that our customers depend on us. Um, we know that we depend on our customers. Uh, the Postal Service is, is the one secure method for our customers for, for delivery, for communication. It's the strength of the Postal Service. Uh, I guess it's the basis of our 83 percent uh, approval rating and, and of course it's uh, that that trust and that service level is essential to the growth of the Postal Service as we continue to grow our current products and any future products so I, absolutely you have our commitment I, I think that maybe we forget how hard the work is um, and anyone who I you know I think it would be really smart for every one of us to just walk along with the, the delivery folks or drive along with the delivery folks. And certainly a day like this reminds us um, of the commitment that um, your people have made and all of the employees of the Postal Service have made to continue to keep the American economy working. Well, and I'll tell you, it's an honor for letter carriers to walk around and, and provide that service because, as you know, at the same time, they have the, the distinct opportunity on, on a daily basis because of where they are day in and day out to serve the American people in so many other ways in terms of watching out for the elderly and, elderly and stopping crimes and putting out fires and, and just all the other things that go along with, with knowing your community and, and knowing the, the families. And speaking to the morale, I, I just want to mention that's a big piece of, of what we need to do with the legislation. Uh, you've got a workforce that, you, you know, that knows they're the most trusted agency in the federal government. Uh, they know that, uh, you know, we've lost 200,000 jobs and the productivity is an all-time high. Uh, yet all they uh, hear about uh, in the media is how the Postal Service is going broke and is irrelevant and, and how we have to, you know, in the past fight, fight uh, legislation where, where uh, certain legislators and leadership of the Postal Service have bought into this uh, strategy of, of attacking the networks and the service that, that we need to grow rather than addressing the elephant in the room. And it's really nice to see now that we, we've got some discussion, consensus going on addressing the real problem, the manufactured crisis, rather than attacking the networks. And that particular leadership of the Postal Service is, is no longer... I think it was particularly rewarding when we look at what we would traditionally see as a bean counter, recognize, you know, the IG recognizing the importance of, of that morale and recognizing the importance of maintaining the workforce and, and really expressing to us concern that we're almost too late given um, uh, where we are. Um, finally, it's, it's, a, it's an issue, and, and it, uh, for me, 
Um, as you know, I am a strong advocate for six-day delivery and uh, a, a even stronger advocate for service performance. And I guess for Fred, um, why is it so important that we have reliable delivery and service? Well, again, it, it is, it, it's, the, uh, it's the one secure method for delivery and communication. Our, our customers uh, depend on that. They, they, they know it's secure. They know it's timely. They trust the person that's bringing the mail. Uh, you mentioned the six day. That's such an important part of the network. Um, you know, we, we, could, uh, we can barely do it in six days. I can't imagine doing it less. We need I to expand or seven, seven or eight days. Yeah, I want to make this point because I think that way too often um, the attitude is that six day is just a jobs program. Right. And, and I want to applaud you for your response, which really was immediately looking at what the customer's needs are. And so, you know, we, 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 I think that's an easy dodge for some people when they're talking about six day to say, oh, that's just, you know, kind of people trying to protect their, their jobs. No, it's people trying to do their jobs and do what's best for American consumers. Would you agree that Congress should move on areas that we have reached some level of significant agreement on, such as requiring actually uh, based uh, payments? Yes, the, the points that the coalition put together, yes, I think we should uh, move forward on those. There, as you know, there's been a lot of issues discussed over the years in different sessions, and uh, none of those uh, None of those pieces of legislation uh, went anywhere because of the objections to many different parties at many different levels. So uh, the idea of putting the coalition together was to find out what we could agree on and our, would the body of what we could agree on be enough uh, to stabilize the Postal Service and, and, and posture it for uh, what it needs to do in the future. And, the, and those were the basic points of that. The, uh, the Medicare integration and, and, and certainly the investment piece. Uh, you know, you can't continue to, you know, provide, a, a, again, a low interest uh, uh, loan to the government, you know, earning 2 to 3 percent when just, uh, you know, the cost of health care is going, health care is going up 5 to 7 percent. Uh, no matter what you have in there, you're going to deplete it doing that. It just uh, doesn't make good business sense. Yeah. Um, President Rolando, I, I, I also want to just uh, uh, hear some of your thoughts on uh, service standard changes and consolidations. Um, I'm concerned about uh, service. Our, uh, our nation's letter carriers work extremely hard to deliver mail to every community, every delivery point. And so thank you for uh, your service and, and, and that service. Um, as I mentioned during the first panel uh, that was before the committee, I heard a great deal of concerns from my constituents when the network rationalization uh, plan was implemented. Can you discuss what letter carriers and other unions have experienced with respect to the recent consolidations and changes to service standards? Uh, yes, I, I think I can speak for probably the other unions in saying we're all extremely concerned about, about the uh, changes that came at the beginning of, of 2015. Uh, as you know, they were put in place with a plan uh, so to close more plants because under the current standards they, they couldn't do that. Um, and, and fortunately, uh, Postmaster General Brennan has, has stopped the closings, but the, the, the changes did go into effect. Uh, we certainly uh, uh, favor restoring the old service standards. Uh, the reason you don't see that, of course, in the consensus bill is because we couldn't uh, come to an agreement for, uh, for the core pieces of this bill, but we're gonna, uh, we will continue uh, to pursue in other venues uh, restoration of the service standards and, and of course if the committee wants to address that I know all the stakeholders will get together and, and discuss uh, with the committee what could be done if that becomes an issue we're willing like I said before to discuss any other issues these are the ones that we we did have the common ground on and, and move forward right, right. right. well uh, I want to thank the panel of witnesses uh, for your time your expertise your input it's extremely valuable